Hello and welcome to Catching Up with the Clemenses, brought to you by the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm Erin and I coordinate school programs. And I'm Jody. I care for the museum's collections. In our last episode, we asked you if you knew what this cabinet was. It's here in the kitchen where we see other typical things like a stove and sinks, even if they don't look quite like the versions we have at home today. This object is something you probably have in your kitchen too. Just a much earlier version of it. This is a 19th century refrigerator. But this house didn't have electricity when the Clemenses lived here. In fact, no houses had electricity. Even so, this refrigerator could keep things cool all year round, even in the heat of summer, using ice. How do you think people back then were able to get ice to cool their food, even in the summer? Humans first developed ways of, prefer of preserving ice thousands of years ago, cutting blocks out of rivers and lakes in the winter and storing them in naturally cool spaces so that the ice melted very slowly. One simple approach was using ice to help preserve food in cold, dark caves. But people also dug deep holes to store ice in special structures called ice wells. If you've ever dug a hole in the ground in the summer, you've probably noticed that the dirt you dug out was cool to the touch. To build an ice well, you dug the, a deep hole, lined it with stone walls, and put gravel at the bottom so that any melted water could drain away. Then you place blocks of ice in with straw all around and on top which insulated the ice and slowed melting. Before the 19th century, preserving ice like this was most common at the homes of wealthy people. For one thing, you needed to own the land you lived on and have some empty land to spare, which wasn't something most people had. Building and filling an ice well took a lot of time and money too. And it only worked if you lived somewhere where you could get ice in the winter. No matter how much money you had, you still couldn't make a lake or a river in Florida freeze thick enough to cut blocks of ice from it. Refrigerators weren't really the main cost here, ice was. Then in the early 1800s, about 30 years before Sam Clemens was born, a businessman from Massachusetts named Frederick Tudor decided to try to transport, store, and sell ice on a larger scale. It took a bit of trial and error and some ships full of water that used to be ice. But fairly quickly, New England merchants were shipping ice all over the country and the world. The term that people back then used for cutting ice out of lakes and rivers was harvesting, because it was sort of like any other natural resource or crop, like timber or corn, which you harvest from particular places in particular seasons. You cut ice in the winter out of rivers, lakes, or ponds and store it to be used throughout the year. The Connecticut River, right here in Hartford, was a common site for ice harvesting. As long as you had, or paid for, permission to harvest ice from a river or a lake, the only real cost was what you had to pay people to help you cut it out and move it. But that wasn't easy. In 1825, Nathaniel Wyeth, a man who worked for Frederick Tudor, invented a way of adapting a horse-drawn plow to cut neat blocks of ice more easily, and this also helped make it more affordable for consumers. Once you had the ice cut, though, where would you store it? in an ice house, of course, which is basically just a very big warehouse, especially designed to slow the melting of all that ice. The ice house helped keep the sun and rain off the ice, both of which would make it melt quicker, and it had drainage at the bottom. This way, any water that accumulated as the ice melted didn't pool around the blocks at the bottom and make them melt even faster. The only other thing you needed to store ice was sawdust which was put between the blocks to insulate them and also to make sure that they didn't freeze together once into one giant block. The reason why the blocks were cut so big and stored in such large quantities is that the more ice you have, the longer it will stay frozen. It sort of keeps itself cold. This is one of the reasons why our modern day freezers work more efficiently if they are mostly full versus half empty. Another reason to cut the ice blocks so large is that the larger the blocks, the slower they melt. You can see this with different sized ice cubes as well. We set up a few different ice cubes to demonstrate. An ice cube from a bag of ice, 
a block of six tiny ice cubes made by the ice machine we have in the museum center, two really funny shaped ice cubes, and one large square ice cube. One thing that affects how fast ice will melt is the ratio of its surface area to volume. Say we have two ice cubes, one with one inch sides and one with two inch sides. The first ice cube has a surface area of six square inches and a volume of one cubic inch of water. The second ice cube has a surface area of 24 square inches and a volume of eight cubic inches of water. This means the smaller ice cube has a six to one surface area to volume ratio, and the larger one has a three to one surface area to volume ratio. This means that a higher proportion of the smaller cube is exposed to the air, and exposure to air that's above freezing is one of the things that makes ice melt. You can see this with the ice cubes we set up here. The smaller cubes melted quickest, followed by the medium-sized ones. We sped up the footage, but in real life, we let these melt for two hours, and the largest ice cube was still looking pretty good at the end of all that time. If you live in a snowy climate, you've probably seen this effect in the spring, when you have that one huge snow bank on, the, on your street or at your school that will take months to fully melt, and then it can disappear very quickly in a rainstorm, which is why protecting ice from the rain was an important part of storing it. Even with this system, there were dangers. For one thing, ice houses could catch on fire. As you can see from this picture, the building would burn down around the ice, which was so cold it could survive the fire. But that meant you had a bunch of sooty ice you couldn't sell, and even worse, you had ice that was now exposed to sun and rain. This ice would now melt a lot faster than the ground beneath could absorb water. So an ice house fire could be followed pretty quickly by a mudslide. Ice houses were also susceptible to floods, which would quickly melt all the ice inside. This was a real danger because often ice houses were located next to rivers. This made it easy to get the ice to the ice house and then get the ice back out to ship, uh, especially if it's all coming from the same river. But it also meant that a spring flood could ruin a whole winter crop of ice. We can see both of these problems if we look at one of Hartford's ice houses on this map. Like many rivers, the Connecticut River rises every spring, putting this ice house in danger. Even the rail line that ran close to the ice house, helping to transport ice in and out, was a danger. A few years after the Clemenses left Hartford, a stray spark from a passing train set this ice house on fire. The growing population depended on ice, but it also made it harder to harvest ice. The factories and farms that lined the river also dumped all of their waste into the river, with the same people who owned and worked in those factories and farms didn't want to buy ice harvested from a polluted river. To avoid this problem, some ice companies built artificial lakes that they could flood with supposedly clean water each fall. Like any crop, the ice harvest depended on mother nature. In Connecticut, rivers and lakes might not freeze thick enough in a mild winter. Ice harvesters would be without jobs in the winter and ice companies who supplied the city would have to pay to import ice from places like Maine in order to keep their customers supplied in the summer. Those customers would, in turn, end up paying much more for that ice. Even a cold winter could make ice harvesting a challenge. If you ever wanted to go ice skating on a pond with a foot of snow on top, you'll know why. This is why even it as the ice trade was growing in the United States, scientists were looking for ways to make ice that didn't depend on mother nature. In 1882, Sam Clemens visited, visited a new ice factory in New Orleans. I went to see them make ice yesterday. The ammonia gas turns the big iron pipes all through the mill, a beautiful milk white, like porcelain. That is to say, coats them with milk white ice, as thick as your hand in an open, spacious building where one occasionally needs to fan oneself to keep warm. Under one's feet are hundreds of little tanks of water, two feet deep and a foot square. Tin tanks they are, but tin boxes. And these are full of pure, clear water undergoing the freezing process. It takes 24 hours. Men are constantly removing the lids and dragging out great oblong blocks of crystal clear ice. Some of these blocks had huge bouquets of splendid fresh roses and other flowers enclosed in them, as in, in shining plate glass. These are to tower up in the middle of a dinner table and cool the air. This ice is solider than that which nature makes, and takes much longer to melt. 
They make 60 tons a day in summer and 100 in winter and sell it at one cent a pound. Sam's letter tells us one way that ice was used in New Orleans where he was visiting, piled on the tables at a fancy dinner party to cool the air. But most of the ice hit he and his family used in Hartford went right here into the refrigerator. For next time, can you figure out where in the refrigerator you would put the ice to keep things the coolest? See you then. Do you have a question for us? You can send us an email at catchingup at marktwainhouse.org or send us a letter at the Mark Twain House and Museum, 351 Farmington Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut, 06105. Along with your question, tell us your first name, your age, and what city or town you live in. If we feature your question in a future video, we'll be sure to give you a shout out. Don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. We want to keep our educational materials accessible to all. But while these videos are free for you, they're not free for us. If you want to support the creation of Catching Up with the Clemenses videos and other educational programming here at the Mark Twain House Museum, please follow the link in the description below to donate now.